Okay, thank you all for attending today's technical webinar. Uh, today we'll be demonstrating the enhanced integration between Civil 3D and Info Drainage. Uh, in the latest version, 2025 release of these products, there has been a significant enhancement to this integration, which is aimed at further enhancing or streamlining your drainage design workflows. The new feature features enable the seamless transfer of hydraulic modeling results from Info Drainage to Civil 3D, which joins the existing integration features already available between these two Autodesk products. We'll also be demonstrating a couple of the other handy features that are part of the 2025 release of Info Drainage that our team has found particularly impressive. <clears throat> okay, um, just to start with a bit of housekeeping uh, for the day. Um, so all registrants today uh, will be muted for the duration of the webinar. Um, you are always free to ask questions at any time uh, using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, your questions will be answered live throughout the Q&A uh, session at the end of the, uh, the day today um, or addressed in real time. Uh, in the days after this presentation, the recording will be made available on our YouTube channel as well. Okay, so if I can please get all attendees here to open up the poll uh, titled Enhanced Civil 3D Integration with Info Drainage. Uh, it can be found under the Polls Quizzes button at the bottom of your screens. Uh, depending on the screen size, you may have to click on the three dots more button first on the right hand side. Uh, please answer these questions as best you can. Uh, there's only a couple of questions in there. Uh, your responses will help us understand how the software is being used uh, to enable us to better support you. And will also inform us, uh, inform us of future webinar topics that you all might like to um, hear presented. Uh, while you are completing that quiz, uh, that poll, sorry, I'll just give you a quick rundown of Info Drainage as a product, as I know a lot of you in attendance today might not be overly familiar with it. Uh, so Info Drainage has been on the market in one form or another uh, for a long time now. Uh, it was acquired by Autodesk as part of the Innovise portfolio back in 2021. Uh, it provides a complete drainage analysis package that can be used as a standalone product or integrated with Civil 3D for enhanced land development drainage analysis. It provides a graphical interface, 1D, 2D design, and plenty of other features, including SUDS design, included as part of the off-the-shelf package. You'll see it in action today and following today's presentation, please get in touch if you would like to know more about product pricing and licensing or how to access free learning resources. I'll now take this opportunity to introduce you to our technical presenter for today. So Rachel is a civil applications engineer here at Civil Survey Solutions. She brings a high level technical understanding of programs such as AutoCAD, Civil 3D and Info Drainage. With experience in both local government in Australia, as well as in the private sector, she's worked on many pro drainage projects across her time. She is part of the wider technical team here at Civil Survey Solutions, ready to assist our customers improve and enhance their workflows to achieve better project outcomes. It will be great to see her demonstrate how this can be done using this significant enhancement to the way Civil 3D integrates into Info Drainage. I will now hand across to Rachel. Thank you, Ben. So today we are going to be looking at Civil 3D and Info Drainage. Um, these two products uh, are quite great in that they can be used together to streamline our drainage design. So today we'll start off in Civil 3D and then we're going to transfer some data over to Info Drainage. Um, what we're going to take a pop across is the pipe network and also our Civil 3D surface. Once we get into info drainage, we'll have a look at uh, creating some more pipes, uh, setting up the rainfall, running some analyses, uh, and finalizing our design. We will then take that design back to Civil 3D. And what we're going to take is the pipe network changes. So it'll actually update the Civil 3D network, as well as bring over some of those hydraulic modeling results. So to start off with, step one is to export our drainage network from Civil 3D. So let's jump into Civil 3D now. What I've got here is a subdivision. Uh, the roads have all been designed uh, and the final surface has been created. We've then gone in and as you can see, there are some pits and pipes that have been created in here using Civil Site Design and they've been pushed out into 
civil 3D. We've also got our profiles over here all created, ready, and we'll have a look at these a bit later when we bring our hydraulic results back in. So seeing as I have all of my drainage network set up and going, I can export it into info drainage. So coming up, I'm going to go to my InnoVise tab on the toolbar and simply click the export to info drainage icon. First, I'm going to select where I want to save my file um, and I'm going to put it in my webinar folder and just give it a quick name. Next, I will select which network I want to select to export. In this case, I've only got one and I can either choose to not export my surface or I can export the surface that it's referencing, which in this case is called final surface. That means I'm gonna take this drainage one network and this final surface across with me when I go to info drainage. The last step is to do the part mapping, which you can see has already been set up for me. Uh, making sure that when I go from civil 3D, the 300 mil pipe is still going to work out at 300 mils when I go across. So finishing that uh, and just give it a second, not much has happened on the screen, but if I come over into my files here, you'll see that this IDDX file has been created, which is what has just happened when I've done the export. And this is an info drainage file also created a surface file below it which will work with that file and bring that surface in. So if I just open that up in info drainage, it'll just take a second to initialize and load the software. You'll see that I'm currently running version 2025.2 which is the current latest software. Just be aware that some of these features may not be available if you're running a earlier version. Here you can see we've brought in that network and also the surface. It's not looking very pretty right now. So I'm going to go into the display settings. In the display settings, you can control all kinds of different things like the uh, coloring to what shows in label styles. Here you can see how I can modify the surface display. I'm going to open up a uh, pre-built template that I have here for surface settings and it's going to bring in my colors here that I prefer to use. So now we can see we've got um, a red through the middle here which shows a ridge line and we've got a low spot in the top right corner which is shown in the blue. I just prefer this style the way that it shows. Zooming in we can have a look at our map uh, at our pipe sorry and you'll see that these are actually spatially uh, in situ, which means that the length of the pipe that you see on screen is the length of the pipe. So now that we've exported that across, the next step is to finish the setup of the drainage network ready to run an analysis. First of all, we're looking at these pipes and it's kind of hard to see apart from the surface where they are. So I'm gonna bring in some CAD data from the import, bringing in this CAD, it's gonna show the uh, property outlines and such so that we have a better understanding of where we're working in our subdivision. In just a second, it's going to allow me to select which layers from the CAD drawing that I want to import. And this means that if you've got a large drawing and there are layers that you don't want to import, or if you want to import them separately so that you control the layer views separately, you could do that. I'm going to leave all of mine ticked on because I have actually already only put the layers that I want into this file. So when I click finish, now you can see I've got all those plots um, or lots set out there and I can now see that, okay, yep, my drains are sitting here in the road reserve. This one here is going through uh, somebody's property so there'll be an easement through there. This is a great feature that not all other drainage has, uh, programs have. So 
next thing to look at is how to build a pipe network. So we've got all these things here, but you could of course build it in info drainage itself. You don't have to come from CAD. And if you needed to, you could add in a couple of extra pits and things. The first thing though, is I'm gonna come over to file and open up my object templates. Now I mentioned I use a template for the uh, display settings, but you've also got templates for everything in info drainage. And that's great because it means that you can save all your preset things that you use very commonly and then just open one file and it will have a list of all the different things that you've created to go in here. So you see that this list has grown quite a fair bit since I've loaded that file. So let's imagine that I forgot to put a pipe and a pit across the road over here. So I can just come up, I first of all add a junction. So let's put in a um, side entry pit and I can just click and that has been put in there for me. And those details of the size and the grade have been pre-filled for me. So when I open them up, I don't have to add them all in. Next, I can add in a connection, which is a pipe. So I will put a 300 pipe in from that pit I just created across and it's going to be a new inlet into this pit here. And it's as simple as that to create a new pit and pipe. Now that I've done that, the next thing that we don't have currently would be some catchments. I'm gonna come down to the end here and this is a road here. So I'm gonna add in a road catchment or an inflow as it's called here. I'm going to use this rafts road, which I've already got set up. And you'll see that it's asking me to draw a polygon. So I can just draw that shape up to the ridge line here, double click to close it. So right click to close the shape. And there I have my first catchment drawn in. If I double click on that, let's open up those properties. All of these factors here, have all been filled in for me because I use that template. If you were to use just a plain inflow, all of these values would be zero and you could go in and add them yourself. Now you can use snaps if you're wanting to trace property outlines, but another way that you can create these catchments would be to bring them in from your CAD drawing, which is what I'm gonna do now. So up in my import tab, I'm going to come to import from CAD inflows. I'll select my catchments file and turning off, I just want that one layer that my catchment boundaries are on. The last question is going to be which of these different inflow types am I using? I'm going to set it up as a rafts urban. is going to create eight inflows for me. And you can see them there in the green shapes with the little icons. Last thing to do with this is some of them will be automatically connected. You can see there's a line for this one connecting it to this pit. Others won't. So you'll have to just check that they're connected up. I'll just quickly go through and make sure that they all connect to a pit. Great, so now that I have all of these created, there's only one thing missing before I am ready to run my analysis and that is the rain itself. Uh, so I've got my pits and pipes, I've got my catchments, we just need the rainfall to drop onto our design. So I'm up in the rainfall pollutants tab of the ribbon here. Um, and there's a couple of ways that you can create rainfall. You can design from scratch. You can import known rainfall information if you have that. Or the great thing about info drainage is it's set up with a R and r There's also a range of other options if you're in other areas. So if I select A, R and R, I'm going to call this one uh, frequent storm 
because I'm going to make two storms here. One's going to be frequent and one's going to be uh, one in 100 year. The first one we're going to use for the first start of the design um, and then we're going to run a flooding analysis later. Here you'll see it's asking me uh, about what area I'm in and it's directly linked to the bomb website but you can download the data that it's then going to run on. Um, you could if you had the files just upload them here. I'm going to zoom in. My site is down here near Ulla Dollar. I'm going to drop a marker there and click download. So we're now talking to the um, weather meteorology website and it's going to download those, ask me where I want to save them. Um, this one is the design rainfall. And the coefficients. Okay, so now that I've got those files populated, I'll come across to the AEP tab. Now I've currently got one AEP here, which is automatically brings in 63.2%. I'm gonna leave that there. If you wanted, you could bring in uh, more rows with more different rainfalls and you can change that to whichever um, AEP you want to use. You can also come across to the storm durations tab and here you can select which durations you'd like to run analysis on. You could select them all. Um, I'm only going to select four because uh, time restrictions, uh, four is good for me because I know that it won't take long to run. Um, so you've got to remember that you're going to multiply the number of AEPs by the number of storm durations by 10 different rainfall templates. So what I've selected now is it's going to run 40 simulations. Uh, that's enough for today's tutorial. Uh, the other option is also for error reduction factors, uh, which are not applicable in my location. Okay, so that rainfall event has been created. If I wanna have a look at it, I'll open up my rainfall manager. And here you'll see that that one there, the AEPs is my event. Uh, I did say I wanted to create a second one. Rather than going through that all again, I'm gonna right click and duplicate it. And I'm gonna call this one my 1% and change that AEP to a 1% storm, which is my flood frequency um, commonly used here in Victoria. Great, so now I'm ready to go to the next step, which is to run both my 1D and my 2D analysis and actually start designing this pipe network. So let's come up to our preliminary sizing tab. Now, one step that I did forget before I can run this is I need to create a flow path. Essentially what a flow path does is it tells what direction the water is flowing in. So I'm going to start with my top no, topmost um, pit and you can click along each pit to tell it which way to go or you can select the top one and then just click the outlet and it will automatically add in all the ones along the way including all the branches in yellow. Now that I've got that flow path over in my tree here, I can change that name. I'm going to call it road one. So now I'm ready to come over to my preliminary sizing. Uh, so let's set up first the network design criteria. So for the calculation option, I'm going to use the rational method. Uh, and choose one of my rainfalls, the AR and R1, which is the 30, uh, 23, 63.2% AEP. Now coming over to my design options, you can have a look at all the different settings here. Now the first one is the size, pipe size library. And I'm going to change that from the default. So when I click here, you can see that defaults only got two sizes there, which isn't very helpful. 
I've actually got a library here that I'm going to load in. And here we have a much larger size range. Now I know that I, where I'm working, they don't allow 225 pipes. So I'm just going to remove that entry there. And so these are the pipes that the software will choose from when it runs this design criteria. Next, it allows you to lock your slope of the pipes if you've got them at a specific slope that you don't want to change. For design options, you've got uh, minimize excavation or minimize pipe diameter, depending on which one you'd like to pick. I'm going to design based on inverts, I'll reduce that minimum cover to 900 and that minimum slope to 100. Max slope can go up to four. And at the bottom here, we've got the manhole sizing or pits. And that's the same as the pipe sizing. You can load in your own library here. I only want to use rectangular ones. So bringing that in will remove all of those uh, circular ones. And this not only contains just pit sizes, but it also gives some criteria. So if the pipe going in or out of the pit changes, it will change accordingly. It will also have changes depending on the depth and also make some changes depending on the access. And that's all included under here. Now, the last couple of things, I'm just going to tick on to allow backdrops, but I'm going to reduce that to half a meter. We do want to check our velocity and the others we're going to leave as they are. So now that I've got all of those criteria set up, I am going to run my network design wizard. This is like a first pass of the design. It's going to take that flow path, that road one, and it's also going to take every branch off of that flow path and it's going to analyze them all. Next, it'll allow you to select the flow criteria again. We've already set that up. The design options we've already set up as well. And now this is a list of all the changes that have been made. So you can see if I hover over any of these yellow boxes, it'll show you what the previous value was and what it is now. So those are all the changes that have been made. You'll also see that I've got a couple of red exclamation marks because of criteria that have not been able to be met. These are the ones that you would have to go back through manually and check. You can also see all the changes to the manholes as well. So assuming that we've gone back through now and checked all those changes, you would now run a 1D analysis. Under the analysis tab here, uh, we've got to set up first the analysis criteria. So this one here, we're going to keep the same rainfall. Uh, and you can see here that it actually tells you it's running 40 storms. You could check both of those if you wanted to, and it would run 80 storms. Uh, but we're just going to work on the first one first. We want to get the design set up for the frequent storms. And then once that's done, then we'll have a look at the more infrequent storms and the flooding. You do have the option to set reduced, shortest or default time step, which will have an effect on how well your um, analysis runs. And you can change those uh, output input tools as well if you wanted to. So now that that's set up, we can run our 1D analysis. I have an error here, which is actually quite good to show you that here it's showing up with some errors. Uh, so you can't actually run the analysis yet, but you can click right here from this form and see what's going on. So you, I've got two inlets here. One has the uh, catchment attached and the other has nothing attached. So I can just delete that straight from this form without having to go anywhere else. Now, I'm just going to fix that up for these three pits. And just run that now. Okay, right, so here we have our results. We ran 40 different storms. Um, and you can see that at the moment, it's just showing the results for one of those storms in each of the pipes. 
and we aren't having any errors show up, which is great. What is here though, is this button critical by return period. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna return results for the worst case scenario. So you can see the storm event shows different numbers, uh, different storms in each of these because it is taking the very worst case storm for each of these uh, connections or pipes. I'm not having any issues here, which is great because this is of course only um, a very frequent storm and we don't want to have any flooding. Now though, let's have a look at some flooding. So we're gonna come back and change those analysis criteria to the 1% storm and turn off the frequent storm. And let's run that analysis again. Okay, so I have an error here with connecting this inflow. It's all right, I will just quickly fix that up. You can always click the validate to check that the site is okay before you click go. Now I am running these analysis on my computer. There is also an option to run them in the cloud if that's something that interests you. Now for this one in 100 year storm, you can see that we have some error, uh, issues with flooding and surcharge. I'm gonna to go to my critical storm and just extend that so I can see the storm numbers here. Because what I want to do is I wanna see which one is having the worst effects because now I'm gonna run a 2D analysis using that very worst storm. So it looks like the half hour storm with storm pattern two is having the most frequent effects on this here. So I'm going to remember that, ready to have a look at that now. Before I do that though, let's have a look at uh, a profile view. So I'm going to show the profile view of that road one, which is the flow path we set up. Let's zoom in here so that we can have a look at what this is showing. We've got a number of different lines. This purple one here is the minimum cover, which is great if you're designing because you can design in this tool by clicking in any of these cells and changing the numbers. In this blue line here, we've got the HGL shown and also the EGL. You'll see this red line just level with the top of the pipe. And that is in fact the uh, highest water level. If I click this play button here, you can actually see um, step by step how the water will look in the pipes. And you can play it one step at a time if you like. These little indicators here are showing that the water is overtopping or close to overtopping in this case here we've reached that uh, 300 free um, threshold value. Um, so we're getting a warning there. Um, okay. So let's run that 2D analysis. We are going to set the criteria up for an urban area because we are going to be building here. Uh, reduce that minimum element to five meters squared. Now the rainfall, we're going to use that 1% AEP. The storm duration was half an hour and the pattern that we just identified was pattern number two. So let's run that storm now. It's just going to take a second but it shouldn't be too long. We go. So let's come up with the results again. Um, we'll just close that down. And let's come over and turn on our 2D analysis. Now it's currently showing me the worst case, like the worst time step. And you can see that there is uh, a depth of flooding through here. According to our legend, it's less than 30 mil. 
You can also see the arrows showing the direction of flow, and that's quite fast, um, half a meter per second. So in seeing that, we can see that we probably do want to make some changes to this. Um, and especially off the top here where it's running into another existing housing subdivision. So back to our PowerPoint. The next step would be to create another proposal. We're going to pretend that we have optimized that design and we have not been able to achieve what we wanted. So let's create a second one. And this time we're going to create a detention basin. So to do this, what we're going to start off with is creating a new phase. Under phase management in the tree view over here, you'll see that I have one phase created, which is drainage one. I want to create another phase that we're just going to modify a little bit. So if you create a brand new phase, you'll have to start from start and bring in your surface again. But I can also just duplicate this phase and make some changes. I'm going to rename it to basin, just so I know which one's which. And you'll see from my drop down here that I'm currently working in basin. I could drop that down if I wanted to change back to drainage. I'm going to build my pond up here near the outlet. So let's zoom in and first off, just delete this pipe here. You'll see the gray pipe showing through below, which is from that drainage one. And if I don't want to see them, I can turn off that light there. I'm also going to change this go to a stop, which means that when I click analyze, it's not going to analyze drainage one, it will only analyze basin. So now that we're set up, let's create a pond. So in build, we're going to come and have a look at stormwater controls. Now under here is where you'll see a lot of your um, different SUDS devices. Um, things like swales and rain gardens. In this case, I have set up a template for a three meter deep pond. And I'm going to use that because it will pre-fill a lot of those information. So it's asking me to click to start a polygon. So let's draw a rough shape in the shape of my block of land. Um, and there we go, we have a pond. Let's have a look at those pond properties. You'll see that uh, from the, our pond is just going down to have a pointed bottom, not a flat bottom. I want that pond to have slides with a slope of one in four. So I'm gonna open up my sizing calculator, change that to side slope, change it to one in four. And it's gonna maintain the top area, but change the bottom area. So. When I click OK, you can see in that graphic what my uh, the shape of the pond is now. And it's updated these areas in this chart here. You can see in the bottom that the total volume is over 4,000 meters cube. Uh, and we'll have a look if that's enough later. When I click out of that, you'll see that this dotted line has been added in. And that represents the, uh, the edge of the flat bottom there. This diagonal line through here is the, um, it's called the center line, which is like the flow part. Now that's not where my water is going to be flowing. So I am going to re-specify that because we've got our inlet down here and our outlet up here. So that more accurately represents the flow direction. What I haven't done yet is actually connect this pit into um, our pond. So let's add in a connection. I'm going to use what's called a no delay, which essentially it acts as though the water is going directly from your outlet into the pond, um, which is more accurate in the modeling. So going from that to our pond, and then another one from the pond, from the pond to the inlet there. 
Now you can see that it's saying that there's an orifice here. So let's have a look and double check that. So I'm just looking at the pit here and the outlet is, yes, it's been put in as an orifice. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna change that orifice. Let me just check the dimensions here. It's 900 wide, so I'm gonna put it in as 800, which should be plenty here. Which essentially is almost free flow. Now having a look at my pond settings again, let's just check this. We've got a depth of three meters and a freeboard of 300 mil. So this is all looking good on this side. Let's have a look at that inlet. It's going to be a point inlet with no delay, which is what we want. Now the outlet we've got set up as an orifice. This time we're gonna to wanna to actually calculate our orifice diameter. Now our design depth was three meters. We're going to assume that we've calculated that the allowable rate of discharge is 20 liters per second. And we've got a coefficient of 0.6. So let's calculate that. And let's put it in for us 0.074. Uh, obviously you would change that to match it as standard pipe size. Last thing to do is under advanced, I just need to set this Manning's as 0.03, assuming that this is going to be a grass bottom on this pond. Now, that's all set up. However, you'll notice that I just quickly drew in a shape for that pond and we've got over four and a half thousand meters cubed of storage, but we don't know how much we need yet. I'm going to just run a quick sizing calculation to see if we're anywhere near the ballpark. So using my quick storage estimate, we're going to design to the exceedance. Let's calculate. Now I'm going to use the planned data, which means that it is going to run a quick drainage calculation using the areas of my different um, catchments here. The allowable outwards discharge is 20 litres per second. Um, and we're assuming that it's impermeable, though you could change that if you wanted to. When I run that calculation, you can see that I probably only need about 2,000 metres cubed. So let's ask it to update the depth, area and volumes to reduce closer to that value. You can see that the value that was brought across is the uh, the mean of those two values that it showed us earlier. So when we click OK, you should see the outline behind here shrink to show you that new size, which is great because a lot of other thing, uh, programs, they might not allow you to actually see it in situ and see physically how much size it's taking up. So, with that all set up, we should be able to run our analysis. Let's validate it to make sure. Yes, I have done all my connections correctly. Um, and double check, we're running our 1% storm. So let's go. Now you'll see here that it's actually showing me the stormwater controls, whereas previously it was showing me the connections or the pipes. Um, so let's have a look at our critical return period. Percentage available, negative 22 flood. That is not good. We need a bigger pond. So now what you would do is you would come back, go to your sizing calculator. We need about 20% more. So, um, so 2,500. And go OK, it's going to recalculate those areas. And you could run again and again. Um, that's the kind of uh, process that you would go through to, in order to get that um, pond size at a better uh, amount. Because uh, you definitely don't want flooding, but you also don't want a pond that is far too large uh, and is just taking up space.
Great. So now that we've had a look at that pond there and we've limited that outflow, the other thing that is very good with the software is the ability to include water sensitive urban design. So let's now make a copy of our pond uh, phase and then we can add in some of these features, show you how they work. So coming over to my phase management, I'm going to duplicate the basin and rename it as WSUD. Let's turn off the basin so that we're just working here. So first of all, let's add in a swale. I'm going to add it down on this road here. I'm going to come over to the build tab and in my stormwater controls, I'm going to do this one in four swale. So that's one in four is the side slope. For a swale, what you do is you can specify the width and then run the length. I have not done a very good job of running that perpendicular and parallel to my road, but that's okay because you can actually come back later and manually change some of these points and edit the shape and size to be more accurate to what you're uh, going to construct on site. Once again, we're gonna add in those connections from the outlet there down to here. Another one is going to go to a new inlet. So I can come to this outlet here for my swale. Um, it's not going to be an orifice, it's going to be a weir going into there. And I'm going to set the width as one meter. Coming back into uh, the dimensions, so we are in the grass swales um, properties here. We've got um, the top width is taken from the surface, added depth, which is included in that template. And it's also used our one in four side slope there. Now, longitudinal slope is going to be about one in 35. I know that because I've done this before. Um, that's what the slope of this road is. So our outlet is where we've got an inlet. We can set side um, and base infiltration rates. Um, you can also set the porosity of the soil. Uh, so that is ready to go. Great. Now, one thing that I did not do uh, was actually set up the pollutants. So if you come up to the pollutant tab here, you can click here um, and you'll see that there's nothing here at the moment. We can add rows for each of our pollutants that we want to run calculations for. I'm just going to run uh, total suspended solids at this time and click OK. Coming back to our swale, you'll be able to see the pollution tab. We have a, a new table that's been added, which shows uh, removal methods, and you can set that up to go. You can either use a percentage or a first order decay. In this case, uh, I know that swales remove about 50% of the total suspended solids that enter them. So I can set that up now to calculate. Of course, it's not actually going to calculate anything because I haven't put any pollutants into the system. If I come to this catchment here under the pollution tab, here I can enter how much is going to be entering off of a urban catchment. It's about 0 0.178 milligrams per liter. The other thing that we didn't look at when we first created these uh, catchments is the rainwater tank tap. You can set this up here to uh, have rainwater tanks either for detention, retention, or both. So this catchment here is actually three households together. So let's add three rainwater tanks. I'm gonna use them for both detention and retention. Um, in my past work, often I find that they have a two QMAC tank with one for one QMAC for detention and one for retention. So I'm going to set that up. Based on a three person household, I'm going to put a half spend of 60 liters per second and limit this outlet flow to, this outflow to five, change that back to one. 
So that is how you add a rainwater tank to um, a catchment. All right, so now we've got this catchment is running into this pit and then it's going through this swale and then back along. Now my other favorite water sensitive urban design element is a rain garden. So I'm gonna put one on this street corner here. Let's go to build. And I've got this by, um, sorry, this rain garden one here that I've sent up. I'm going to draw my area here, just on the corner of that block and delete that pipe there so we can add in those new connections. Having a look at those settings, I have already set most of these things up, so it will just run. It's got our Manning's excellent, our long slope one in a hundred. Here you can set up your filter media. So I've got one set up here of a sand with a 250 mil, uh, meter per hour conductivity rate. Coming across to pollution, you can also set up that again, which is around 50% for a rain garden. It does these calculations based on storage time um, as well. So they are based on real world data. Just double check these inlets and outlets here. You can set up the under drain as well. And you can also again set up your infiltration rates or not, whether or not you have it as a lined or unlined rain garden. So let's just analyze now. We're gonna have a couple of problems. So where I connected and unconnected is uh, what's happening here. I just forgot to delete those, but you can see how easy and quick this is just to make those little checks. Uh, I forgot to size that orifice that is going into the rain garden. It really should be more of a weir. Just bear with me for a second here. Um, we'll just double check. There we go. So our connections are all set up so we can run that analysis again. And this time we can see not only for the pond, but also for the swale and the rain garden if they are going to overtop as well, which the rain garden most definitely needs to be bigger. The other cool thing is that once you've added these things in, if we come down to our flow path, because it's a new phase, we are going to have to build a new flow path. Going from the top to the outlet there, we'll look at our profile and you can actually see the pond in profile view, which is great. So we've done a whole bunch of different designing things here. Let's now go back, take these changes. So I'm going to take uh, the basin design back into Civil 3D. In Info Drainage, I don't actually have to do anything. I just have to save. So uh, back to our PowerPoint, the last step was import those updated drainages to Civil 3D. I'm going to jump over into Civil 3D. This is where we left off when we exported earlier. And all I have to do is we're again in the InnerVise ribbon, click on import from Info Drainage. First, I'm gonna select that file. So the webinar file there. Now it's gonna ask which phase I want to import. So I do not want drainage one. I in fact want the basin and I'm going to import those changes onto the drainage one network, network that's already in this drawing. And I do not want to load the surface. I'm going to use the existing 3D surface. I don't want to create a new network for this one. I want to not import it. 
Here I need to map across from um, civil 3D or info drainage back to civil 3D. And I'll just double check that they're all correct. Okay. Put those ones in. There we go. Let's have a look here. Uh, so this is talking about that pipe that I deleted when I put in my drainage, um, the detention basin. So that pipe has been removed. It's asking us what we want to do. We're going to delete the new civil 3D data. Excellent. So there's all the things we've brought in. As you can see, Civil 3D doesn't have a pond. So what has been brought in is just the outline um, and the base of the pond and it's created a surface there. It's brought in all these new pipes and pits and their corresponding data. Let's have a look over at these profiles here. It's not hugely obvious, but they have been updated here Look, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today and listening in. I'd like to certainly thank Rachel um, for her fantastic uh, presentation. Um, as I said, this uh, re recording will be going up on our YouTube page in the next couple of days, so keep a look out there. Otherwise, thanks again, and I hope everybody has a good afternoon.